to start putting the presentation? Yeah, yeah. I will share the screen. Mm -hmm. Let me... Oh. So you see it? Yeah, perfect. So we are gonna stand on time, 11.30. Yeah. For me. Just, um, I think you have 55 minutes plus five questions, right? Uh, 50 minutes. Ah, uh, 50, 10 minutes. But I will talk less, uh, like 40 minutes. Okay. So I will tell you only uh, at uh, 45 minutes that yeah, you are, okay. I will make a sound, um, I don't know. Can you listen to this? Let me check. Well, I'm gonna make a sound that you will hear. I'll just say, Peter, stop. Okay. <laughs> no, I will say, Peter, you have five minutes. Yeah, then... more or less, yeah. Okay, perfect. In two minutes. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, we are gonna get started. So um, welcome back to our last session of uh, this conference, Iguara 2020. Uh, our last speaker of the conference is gonna be Peter Hess. Uh, he's gonna present algebraic extension of general relativity. So please go ahead. Peter. Thank you very much. Part of which I will present uh, here is published in uh, this review article that just came out in focus in particle and nuclear physics. Uh, the content of the talk will consist of the following. First, I will give an introduction about the history of form attempts to extend general relativity from Born, Einstein, and others. I will concentrate on algebraic extension, which uh, means that coordinates and or the matrix are extended from real uh, quantities to something more complicated. Then I will give some predictions of pseudo-complex general relativity. This is a theory I will discuss at the end. It's one type of algebraic extensions. And then conclusions will be drawn. First of all, it is not sure that general relativity is still valid in strong gravitational fields. For example, you have problems of loss of information in the black hole. Black holes don't have hairs. One is sure that condensation's effect have to be included in order to avoid the singularity at the center. Then there's the event horizon, which is the effect of a, the result of a strong gravitational fields. Well, there are people who are saying that, uh, why you are uh, complained about uh, eliminating, eliminating the event horizon? Well, there are several people, many people who are, uh, who are worried about that. Uh, it's a different kind of event horizon than in other 
cases of event horizons. For example, you can have a black hole in the corner of your room and you cannot access it. This is from a philosophical standpoint, maybe a little bit worrisome, but uh, it's a matter of taste. But anyhow, all these other uh, problems hint to the possibility that uh, GR, general relativity, probably has to be extended. You have to add something to it. And these changes uh, should be only visible near the strong, in the area of strong gravitational fields. In the past, since the, uh, short after the construction of the general relativity, several attempts have been made to extend uh, the general relativity or the related change of matrix and coordinates. For example, one of the first attempts, not the first one, was done by, uh, was published by Albert Einstein. He wanted to unify uh, general relativity with electrodynamics, one of his dreams. So he proposed a matrix which has two real, uh, two real parts, G mu nu and F mu nu, and one is in the real part and the other is in the imaginary part. Uh, imposing the symmetry condition G star mu nu as G nu mu, one can prove easily that uh, the G mu nu is symmetric as it is in general relativity in most cases, and that F mu nu is anti-symmetric. So it has this property of the electromagnetic field tensor in electrodynamics. However, when you go to the weak field limit, not to strong gravitational fields or the flat space, then the, uh, in constructing the equations of motion, starting from the Einstein equations, uh, the complex part does not approach the Maxwell equations. So this was abandoned afterwards. Uh, one of the first, or the first attempts to my knowledge is uh, proposed by Max Born. His motivation was that he didn't like the, the asymmetry of coordinates and momenta in general relativity. While in quantum mechanics, you have the symmetry. You can interchange coordinates with momenta, you can apply canonical transformations, uh, so everything is fine. Uh, in general relativity, the main quantity is the length element, only depending on the coordinates, and he added at a high energy limit, what he calls high energy limit, a momentum part, which has a similar structure and he could derive equations of motions for the low and high energy limit. To interpolate, he later uh, joined these two length elements, so he just plus, uh, put a plus sign, and for dimension reasons he had to introduce an L squared, where L is a minimal length scale. I will come back to that. So when uh, he did some manipulations, for example, he worked in the momentum space and showed that you have objects like B squared minus P squared, which should be positive. So he introduced there a maximal momentum, an upper limit, a momentum cutoff. With that, he could show that in the integrals, which appeared in the perturbative treatments of field theory, which were inf infinite, uh, he could show that uh, you get finite results because essentially you introduce a momentum cutoff. <clears throat> this work was not very much uh, noted, which uh, he complained about once, but it's an interesting idea because the maximum acceleration or maximum momentum implies a maximal acceleration. A maximal acceleration implies a minimal length scale as a parameter. And he noted one important uh, thing. Uh, he said that this length parameter is a parameter. It's not subject to Lorentz transformation. Uh, so uh, this may hint to an effective theory which has a minimal length, which is not a physical length, but a parameter. Nowadays, there are several theories which introduce a physical length, which is subject to Lorentz transformation. But if you want a minimal length, which is not subject to Lorentz transformation, you have to deform the Lorentz transformation. So things get complicated. Maybe this kind of approach may uh, lead to an effective theory which is more easy to treat. Now I come to algebraic extension. They were discussed by Kelly and Mann in 86. <clears throat> you define new coordinates, which is x mu, the old one, and then a linear combination of a i, y i mu. Really, one of the a i's is in front of x mu. I wrote it only in this form to make this difference. 
the AIs form an algebra, therefore it's called an algebraic extension. The, the product of two AI, of an AI and J gives you linear combinations where you sum over K. Now they discuss several, quite a general uh, list of algebraic extensions. The real one, this, with this would be the general relativity, the complex one, the pseudo-complex one, where I can come back to, quaternion, hyperquaternions. So you can get a matrix, which is symmetric and anti-symmetric. And then they went to the weak field limit. In the weak field limit, you can show that the kinetic energy has the form given here, this one and this one for the symmetric part and for the anti-symmetric part. And the anti-symmetric part has an IA squ AI squared in front. Well, uh, really it has a CII zero in front. Uh, I only wrote this in order to uh, put to attention that I squared is minus one. So when an I squared is minus one, we have one of the generators which is minus one. You, you are uh, you have the wrong sign. You have the sign of a ghost solution which cannot propagate freely. They also discussed Tachyon solutions, and so this uh, studied all the possible extensions and found out that only two cases don't have ghost solutions and or uh, and uh, Tarion solutions. This is the general relativity case and if you extend it to the pseudo complex case. They used uh, instead of pseudo complex a name uh, hypercomplex, but there are other names like para complex. So it's not very well defined this notation. And the pseudo complex we use because it was introduced in our institute by Frederick Schuller who visited us for couple of years, many years ago. So only the PC extension is safe, consistent. And for this reason, uh, we consider the pseudo complex extension and not others. Now there are other in attempts to extend uh, general relativity. Uh, in analogy to Max Born, Cajanello did it uh, in the start of the 80s proposing an extended length element, which is just the sum of the original one and one which depends on the velocities. So instead of momentum, he used velocities. For dimensional reasons, you have to put an L squared in front. And this L, so L is the minimal length. Uh, now you, uh, so it only contributes when you have large uh, accelerations because you, when you divide by x mu x nu, don't tell it to a mathematician, it's just for uh, simplicity, then uh, the do d u mu d x mu is an acceleration. So uh, Feoli and Cajanello, they extract this dependence and get a correction factor, sigma of x, where you have the maximum acceleration contained. This procedure really violates uh, Lorentz uh, uh, symmetry, uh, so it's an approximation. Uh, when acceleration is of the order of one over L, then this uh, correction factor becomes important. And the studied cases where the infall of material is stopped before reaching the Schwarzschild horizon. So it's a met, uh, also a motivation to avoid the formation of a event horizon and a black hole. Uh, I also refer to the talk within this conference of a parallel talk by Abdel Tavifik he derived this uh, kind of expressions from a, a microscopic point of view. So it was a very interesting talk for me. Now we come to complex extensions. So it violates uh, the uh, condition. It creates ghost solutions. I discuss it uh, uh, of, because of completeness. It is a non-published work. Later on, they published other works related to that, but this is the original work not published. It's in an archive. So what they de did is to define complex coordinates and they uh, wrote it in terms of a general matrix, several components where the bar uh, denotes the, the complex part of the matrix and they impose the condition because they have eight dimensions. They impose a condition to get back to the four dimensional space. They require that you can only move in the four dimensional subspace, which is real. Uh, so they get this new uh, matrix and they related it to the coordinates x mu and y mu. And then you get again the proposal by Cajanello plus an additional part. 
but if you use an uh, uh, Minkowski metric, this is just the dispersion relation. So you uh, have to put a condition that this is zero, and then you get back to the uh, Cayanello part where in Y mu the L is included, is proportional to the four velocity times L. So you get X scan L squared times du mu d u mu. And then we come to the pseudo complex extension. It has the same form as a complex extension, except that I squared is one. And this changes the mathematical properties. If you define new objects, sigma plus minus, via this expression, uh, the sigma plus minus have the property of a projector. And sigma plus times sigma minus zero. What does it mean? It means if you have two non-zero elements, one proportion sigma plus, one proportion sigma minus, if you multiply them, you get zero. So you have a zero divisor. The variables don't form a field, but they form um, a ring. And this has some uh, mathematical properties I don't want to get into, but the coordinates you can also write in terms of the zero divisor basis, where the x plus and x minus are related to the coordinates x mu and y mu as shown here. Also interesting is to show what is the the structure of the variables, if you have only one degree of freedom, the real part, the pseudo imaginary part, and the di diagonal uh, lines are proportion sigma plus and sigma minus. So it looks like a light cone, but it has to do that uh, these variables have a group structure of 1,1 if you have one degree of freedom. You can also define matrix in the zero divisor basis with sigma plus, sigma minus. And when you define the symmetric combination, anti-symmetric combination, you get this expression, the length element squared. Note that if uh, you use the same metric in the both zero divisor components, the metric are still different because x mu nu depend on x mu plus and uh, the x mu nu, uh, g mu nu depend on x mu minus, which are different. So the arguments are different. Now, when you require, again, in order to get to a four dimension subspace, that uh, the uh, <coughs> that the particles can only move in the four-dimensional subspace, which has no i component in the length element. Then you get back the uh, length element, the more general one than Cayanello uh, before in the complex extension, and you get an additional contribution. But when the two matrix are equal, this is a correction proportion to L. Again, it has to do that x plus and x minus are different, so it's proportional to L, L squared, not to L. Requiring that the three dimensional part is zero, you get this condition, uh, sigma plus minus sigma minus just I, and you have to solve it, which is very difficult. We succeeded uh, recently, and uh, the result is shown in the next trans, uh, uh, transparency. Uh, we uh, only looked at the lowest order contribution of L, and we found this uh, solution for the radial component of y, the angular components uh, we didn't uh, uh, show, we don't show here. Uh, the main part is the radial part. And you see for most of the uh, uh, the radial distances, it's of the order of L. Here I used a particular matrix, which is a matrix we will have shown you will, uh, later on of the pseudo complex matrix, where the uh, event horizon is at, is at 3 half m not at 2m as the Schwarzschild radius, so it's further in. And there is the surface of the star, because the metric has a minimum there. So it stays of the order of L for a long part of the time, but explodes at the event horizon. So <coughs> this solution is not valid there anymore because of the approximations we did, but it shows that uh, it only gives main contribution proportion to L, except at the event horizon when something may happen. Then, uh, last but not least, I mentioned Moffat's metric extensions. It starts from a complex metric, defines the symmetric part and anti-symmetric part, which is shown here, and imposes this metric condition as Einstein. And he did some manipulations uh, in his first works. The main motivation of his work was to avoid uh, the formation of event horizon. So he obtains a correction in the time component of the metric, and which has to be positive. So uh, R can be never lower than L, where L is now not a minimum length, but a macroscopic length. 
So this was his way to avoid uh, the forming of an event horizon for the Schwarzschild case. His theory is called uh, uh, non-symmetric uh, non gravitational theory. Uh, I mentioned he, his attempt because he also discussed the relation to uh, quantization and another paper which is shown here uh, related to his uh, uh, gravitational theory. He showed that uh, you can construct systems where the coordinates don't commute. This is a non-commutative quantum gravity. And only as a remark, uh, I mentioned that you can get the same in the pseudo-complex formulation, which I published in Astronomische Nachrichten in 2015. The idea here is we have a flat space, not a curved space, but we impose quantization conditions for the pseudo-complex coordinates and momenta. So the coordinates have a pseudo-imaginary uh, component and the momenta have a pseudo-imaginary component. And if you impose that the coordinates uh, commute as usual, then the uh, old coordinates have an L squared contribution. Here I extracted the L dependence from uh, Y mu and Y nu. So it has an L squared contribution as shown by Snyder for the first time in 47 in one of his publications. You can look it up here. Also the other commutation, X with P and uh, P with P have similar contribu additional contributions to L squared. So it might be that the pseudo complex description might help to get a quantization of the theory. Now I come to the pseudo-complex uh, general relativity, which is shown in this book, which is published in this book and the more recently in the, uh, in the review article I mentioned at the beginning. The action is uh, uh, given here. In the book still we used a modified action, but at the end of the book we showed that it is the same as a standard uh, action principle with a constraint. And the constraint is that uh, d omega squared has the next element squared has to be real. Here all object except also this x, uh, it should be a large x, is pseudo complex. It looks the same as an Einstein theory. This is the which is scalar and the alpha is in cosmological theories it's constant but if you have a central object it can depend on r and if you have a, a rotating object even on theta. So you vary this action and you get in both zero divisor components the Einstein equations. Now these are plus minus, each of them are real. And the, here C is one and G is one. The energy momentum tensor is given here in terms of Y. And uh, uh, if you neglect the contributions of Y, you get, uh, uh, well, at least these contributions, uh, you get the energy momentum tensor, which is written down here. Here, the K and uh, R there if Y is different from zero. So uh, that's far uh, as we could go with the pseudo complex theory. The next step is to see, to say, what is this T mu nu? The lambda indicates it has to do with uh, dark energy and it is repulsive. We cannot calculate them within this uh, pseudo complex theory as we have it now. So we have to follow a phenomenological path and put it in by hand and some information we get by calculations as from at Visas and others, which calculate the vacuum fluctuations in a curved background. So when you do that, and he did it for the Schwarzschild case, you get an R to cube correction, one over R to six correction, and with this term one minus two M over R squared, times a function which is a complicated function in R. So what it says, first vacuum fluctuations are increasing towards the center when gravity gets larger and it explodes at the Schwarzschild <coughs> horizon. The problem here is they don't change the background medic, but when you increase vacuum fluctuations, it also gravitates. So if vacuum fluctuations get strong, you have to incorporate, recouple it to the matrix and this uh, they didn't do. There are some uh, uh, publications on that uh, by other people, but it is very hard to do. We choose the phenomenological path to say, okay, the uh, vacuum fluctuation, the density decreases with uh, some power law, the simplest one. And we introduce a parameter which uh, 
describes the coupling between the mass and the vacuum fluctuations. N is equal to two is ex uh, excluded by solar system experiments. It cannot be. N equal to three, we worked with for most of the time until these guys, Nielsen and Bjornholt, showed analyzing the Kirchner wave event and using pseudo convex general relativity that in order to describe the, the infalling uh, phase of the merge of two black holes, n has to be less than three. So we now take n equal to four, and uh, but without security that this is the last uh, uh, step. And when you take n equal to four, it has a one over r to six fall off. So let's see what is happening. Uh, the important point here is that there is, seems to be a principle in behind that mass not only curves uh, the space around it as described in general relativity, but there is a quantum effect uh, related to it. It uh, changes the quantum properties around a uh, black hole around a large mass and it uh, accumulates vacuum uh, or something like that, and uh, which has an effect on the matrix. And we choose a parameter be such that there is no event horizon from a philosophical point of view. Okay, here we get this care solution of this uh, model, which has a standard form, except you have these contributions with this parameter BN in it, which changes uh, the properties. And it's just assumed here with a graph, which is important to understand some of the predictions. Uh, if we choose a BN greater than uh, this value, then there's a no, va the no event horizon, which will choose equal to this value. Then there's an event horizon for the curve parameter A equal to zero, still at three half at this value shown here. And, uh, uh, and it makes calculation simpler. What he, I have plotted here is the optical frequency omega, the vertical axis uh, for and as a function of R for the rotational parameter A 0.9 M. So you see, this is the curve of the general of general relativity. It's increasing, it's stopping here because as they have the event horizon. And uh, in our case, we have two curves, n equal to three, which is excluded already, n equal to four. You see when n is increased, it moves further to the right, but it has a maximum and then falls down. What does it mean? If you have a particle or several orbits in an accretion disk, of circular orbits in an, uh, in an accretion disk, orbits which are nearby, which are neighboring orbitals, and they are here or here, they have distinct orbital frequency, they create friction, friction creates excitation of the disk, and this is emitted via light, for example. But if you have two neighboring orbit, orbitals near the maximum, they have uh, nearly the same orbital velocity, friction is low, and uh, uh, the light emission at this point should diminish significantly, forming a dark ring. So in ca any kind of equation disk model, you should see a dark ring, followed by a bright ring again, bright ring again, which is very short because it falls off very uh, strongly up to the, uh, the point where the surface of the star is, there where they finish, the metric has a minimum and we assume that there's a surface of the star. Then there's uh, uh, the question of stable orbits. I will concentrate on n any, any equal to four. It is uh, the uh, position of the ISCO, the innermost stable circular orbit uh, in GR, for example. It starts with six at a equal to zero and it ends at one for a equal to one. But in the pseudo complex general activity, the surface is here for uh, n equal to four. So it goes up to three half. And to the left, the no, no stable orbits. And to the right, the stable orbits are all un, up to the surface of the star. Uh, so at small a, the theory follows very neatly the general activity. So there is, it, it is not possible to see some structural changes except because the orbit is uh, the last stable orbit is further in, and it releases more gravitation energy, so the emission should be brighter. But here it goes up to the surface of the star, and it 
touches the position of the maximum, which is independent um, on A, uh, it is at pound uh, around 1.73 M. So it's a little bit higher. So this you have to take note of if you look now for the simulation in, uh, or in within pseudo complex relativity for A is 0 0.8, 80 degrees inclination with respect to the observer. And to the left, we have used a small uh, resolution, uh, a high resolution. And you see here this dark ring and the bright inner ring. Here we used a thin, uh, the model of a thin infinitely extended accretion disk by Page and Thorne from 74, but uh, M87 uh, surely has a much thicker disk and torus maybe. So this is uh, not representing the, uh, the correct structure, but it's only important that in this simulation, we can see a dark ring followed in by a bright ring. Now, when we go to the uh, resolution of 20 micro arc seconds, the uh, event horizon telescope has 24, so even worse. Uh, pardon, you cannot see anything of this structure. So you cannot distinguish these two theories. We had some hope that you can see something, but really if you smear out the resolution, you don't see anything. And here I have to say something about the simulations they show in the six letters. They only use light rings and smear them out. And I don't understand, I don't agree that they have to use light rings because M87 has a prominent jet, it has a accretion disk, so the light, uh, the light emission they see around the shadow of the black hole should be related to the emission disk and not to light rings. Furthermore, if you lose, use general activity and assume that, which is quite sensible, I would say, that A is very large, most of the light rings are blocked by the accretion disk. The light rings have to pass through the orbital planes where they are blocked. And in pseudo complex general activity, all of them are blocked. So I don't understand, I would like to understand why they use light rings. And uh, a couple of months ago, before the pandemic, uh, there was a talk by an astronomer from uh, who participated in AHT uh, in uh, the EF UNAM. And he said that you can take any kind of material around the shadow and smear it out, you will probably you would get the same agreement. So I have here large critics. Then we, in this publication uh, mentioned below, I, we simulated a cloud around the black hole, uh, better to say a toy cloud, which is approximated at the time t equal to zero by a straight line. And uh, one of the positions corresponds to the maximum of the orbital frequency. Here's the time uh, plotted versus R for complete uh, run around the black hole. And there's a minimum corresponding to the maximum of the uh, orbital frequency. So you see it uh, evolves such that it forms a V-shaped structure. And that uh, means that if you have a cloud which is more or less spherical falling at orbiting the black hole, it will uh, develop a V-shaped structure <coughs> with an arm towards the black hole and a longer arm uh, uh, towards the outer side of the black hole. And maybe this can be seen in Sagittarius A star. I don't know because the resolution is still too low for the event horizon telescope so that it can confirm general relativity or that is consistent, but they cannot still distinguish between other theories as ours. Then at the end, uh, uh, I well, nearly to the end, I will discuss redshift at the surface as a function of asymmetrical angle. Uh, and you see, as it depends on A. If A is zero, it's high up. But if you increase A for A equal to two, you see here a curve, which is uh, above six, 6.5. It starts at uh, the polar region, zero, and then it gets very high up. But when you increase A, you get lower and lower and lower, and you get a little bit lower than one for the maximum rotation A equal to one, but at the equatorial plane, you cannot see anything. So that might be that if you have infalling matter uh, falling onto the surface of the black hole, uh, or what you call black hole, here's more or less a gray star, 
you may see light emission, but if you have an accretion disk, as most black holes have in the center of galaxies, uh, you, they have a jet, and the jet is overshining anything. You have to look for a black hole which has no accretion disk, and this may be the case for Sagittarius A star. It is has not it's not known to have an accretion disk if it has a very small one, and there's little light, um, uh, uh, little possibility to form a jet, and maybe you can see something that the poles, but with a large uh, redshift. The last uh, comment I want to say is about neutron stars. I saw in this conference that there were uh, uh, calculations that you can form neutron stars up to maybe 2.5. Here I want to refer to a publication we made uh, in 2014 and 2016. And this mass can be easily reached and larger because what happens Vacuum fluctuations are building up not only not only outside the black hole but also inside uh, uh, the star, and uh, if it's strong enough, it holds to the collapse of the star and forms stable stars with large masses. If they are neutron stars, I don't know. We don't know the surface property of the stars. We don't know what are the magnetic fields. Can they form uh, jets or cannot they form jets? I don't know. But uh, there's a possibility that easily you can uh, form uh, neutron stars with larger masses when uh, you include vacuum fluctuations and when and if and only if these vacuum fluctuations are strong enough. Here we use the parameter. If this is proven by observation, I don't know, but we have to see it. So I come to conclusions. Uh, I discussed algebraic eccentric theory showing that only the pseudo-complex extension is consistent. Uh, I gave some uh, historical review for various motivations by Einstein, by Born, by Guy, uh, Kai Yellow, and I gave at the end some predictions, as, uh, what I didn't mention here, the last comments about neutron stars. But I uh, also uh, want to mention that there are other formulations, extensions of general relativity. I especially refer to the work by uh, Struckmeier and Vasak. Uh, they used a canonical formulation with very interesting possibilities, new solutions of uh, Einstein's theory. And what I like, the, their formulation is completely geometric and maybe this kind of new extensions, including vacuum fluctuations, are in the geometric formulations. Um, I didn't mention moon theory. Maybe I will include it in uh, or in quava stars. Uh, maybe I will include them uh, in the contribution. Uh, there were several talks about scalar theory. So what I talked here about is only one under many. Okay, here I finished the talk in time, and I would like to uh, make propaganda for the next meeting. Well, it's <laughs> 2021, so it's not 2020. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is from 5th to 11th September, so I invite you to come there. It will take place in Palacio de Mineria. If you are still allowed to enter there, we are now in a strong discussion how to organize <laughs> the meeting. Uh, it will be mainly presential, but uh, uh, maybe we in, uh, in include some of the uh, virtual part, for example, a streaming of the conference in the internet so that, so that non-participants can follow the meeting as one proposal, but let's see. Uh, we also will uh, hopefully be able to visit uh, uh, Teotihuacan, one of the main sites nearby, which was uh, is or was one of the most important cities in the first millennium, according to the Christian calendar. And uh, I only mentioned that uh, many queens and uh, kings of the Mayas uh, justified the right to the throne uh, of being descendants from the people from uh, Teotihuacan. So this uh, means something. So it is interesting. And we will have a couple of talks uh, about Teotihuacan. So here I stop. And uh, let me see if I can, can back. Uh, but we have a question to you. Yeah, let me see we if I can back the stop share. Yeah, a question. Okay, the question is of uh, Psi Piran. 
There are many problems with standard gravity in cosmology, dark energy, dark matter, and so on. Do these corrections help in solving any of these problems? Sure, it can help. We have even published uh, uh, many years ago uh, a theory on cosmology, but uh, we could reproduce uh, uh, accelerating universe uh, with accelerating forever, which go to a constant acceleration or go to zero acceleration. <laughs> the problem here is we don't have a, a manner. It's not predictive. That I want, I want to say. It's not predictive because we have many possibilities depending on the parameters we put in. So here it would be better to have a contribution from a theory which maybe uses a pseudo-complex extension which is more microscopic. So uh, in the cosmological case we can fit anything. Okay. Thank you for this very nice talk, Peter. So if you uh, have nothing against it. I want to close the conference with some explanations. Is it fine? Yes, go ahead, please. So, well, we now come to a close to Ivara 2020, uh, uh, 2020. This time it was organized completely online, as you surely have noticed by now. And we are pleased that it worked <laughs> very well. We have we had many preoccupations, especially I, because I'm a little pessimistic. But uh, it worked extremely well, and it may uh, show some alternative way to organize a conference. But this is also thanks to a great team. The team around Cesar Sen, Benno, and so on, Dimitir. And also to Mariana and her team of the poster session, uh, including uh, Luz uh, Urania and Gabriela, um, and to Stephen Gulberg which provided us a very stable platform. And of course, uh, to um, Jeremy Hessman, without uh, these two guys, we would have been uh, not able to organize this conference. So many thanks. Also many Mag thanks Magno also, yeah? Magno, yes, all, it's your team. So I meant, don't, don't mention everybody, otherwise I have to read the list of the International Advisory <laughs> Committee and the local uh, organizing committee. But there were many people of them who really contributed much to the success of the team. And I was really surprised. Now I will repeat uh, what we have uh, agreed on the proceedings, uh, the uh, Cesar and I and, uh, and others. Uh, it will be published in Astronomische Nachrichten, the oldest journal in astronomy, uh, as far as I know. Uh, 1892. We? 1892. 1892. Ah, yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, uh, it uh, from the se nearly second centuries ago. <laughs> uh, now they require uh, contributions which fulfill the criteria of uh, new articles, not a proceeding where you can publish something and what you have published elsewhere else. The contributions have to be new or have to be contain something new. Uh, so there will be strict reverie process. The deadline for sending in articles is before November 6. Uh, I told you already, November 6, we have to send in the material to Astronomische Nachrichten. So it's one to two weeks before we need all of your contributions. If the contributions don't, don't come in by then, very well, it might be that they will not appear in Astronomische Nachrichten. So take it seriously, but you have time. If you write to start to write now, or most of us surely have already started to write some pages, you can send them even earlier. So please do so in order not to uh, uh, miss a deadline. I stress this mainly because of the Latin Americans. Okay, I know then that they ended at the last date. <coughs> you have to send in the tech file, the BIP file. The bibliography uh, have, uh, are not allowed to be in the tech file. You have to send in these two files, tech and BIP and all the figures. And uh, please also PDF file to make it easier for us. Uh, 
And uh, then there will be referee process. Uh, we try to get answer for every within a week, and I'm surely I'm sure that uh, we have to send some critics of the referee to the participants. Therefore, I say two weeks before the deadline. Please not after that. So if it goes after that, we will try to do anything possible. But if it doesn't meet the deadline of the 6th November, sorry, it's over. Uh, send all the contributions to Cesar. He will distribute it to the editors. I will be the editor of the parallel sessions and probably I will contact all of you when I don't uh, know to whom to send the contributions. So please answer them, uh, answer me quickly. And uh, so uh, the posters, the three winning posters can send in the contributions, six pages. So please start to write the contributions now. And within one to two weeks, I don't see any difficulties to write it. The experimentalists, uh, they may have some problems. You have to ask for permissions. So please try to start now for the permissions of that group. Uh, uh, Peter, if they have any technical problem, they can send me a mail, okay? Okay, uh, send uh, Cesar a mail. Uh, so the Ivara 2021 will now be organized by three principal organizers, Cesar, Mariana Vargas, and me. So I hope uh, 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 this will be a great, I'm sure that will be a great improvement. Um, and probably will incorporate some experiments of 2020 to 2021. If there are no further questions, I thank again to all of you because this conference wouldn't have been able uh, without all of you. And we can see you next year, hopefully in person. And I hope the only Corona we will meet there is in the form of a bottle and this is a beer, uh, <laughs> a Mexican beer. So Cesar is showing it. Okay. <laughs> Peter, okay. I would like to to take a picture of all the panelists that are the only that I can yes. take. So I would like to ask Jesus, <laughs> Irina, and, and there is one last one that is missing the camera. Could everybody yes. in Irina, the panelists? Irina, Irina. Jesus, Vladimir. Irina. Vladimir. Please switch on your camera if you're still there. Uh, uh, Vladimir, mm. Karas. I can start yeah, my but it it doesn't doesn't mean, You can't start your video Let because me. the host yeah. has Please, stopped. please, Vladimir. Yeah. Irina. Is the host, is the host that is... It tells me Vladimir. you can't start because the host stopped you. Ah. Mm. Uh, uh, let me, let me, let me. Yeah. It's going. Yeah, now we have Dimitri. one more. Uh, oh, don't move. D okay, uh, yeah. Dimitri. Okay. Dimitri. Yeah, and there is one missing, <laughs> Vladimir. Okay. Jesus is coming. Okay. Jesus is everybody coming. Is okay, coming. Okay, good. I think I have everybody now. Okay. 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 Vladimir, okay. Irina is missing. Well, Thank you very much. It was an amazing, uh, an amazing meeting, and congratulations yeah. to the organizers because that was a uh, Titanic. Uh, um, yeah, a Titanic experience for you, I can imagine. So congratulations yeah, to you all. That's true. The backstage yeah. was crazy. <laughs> yes, uh, the, the backstage, backstage we were was going crazy. around localizing people <laughs> and uh, uh, complaining and things like yeah. that. But uh, hope, uh, we kept it uh, inside and not discussing it outside. Yes. <laughs> oh, I did that. Sorry for the others because we just got the idea of have pictures today. Okay. But next time we will have picture for everybody. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> bye. We'll stop. Thank uh, you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>